Because what I wanted to know was, uh, which salespeople had the best conversion rate? No idea. Well, which salespeople have the highest activity level? No idea. Okay, my name's Ez Chandra and welcome to this episode number four of Ez Chats and we're chatting with um, Lee Farnell about sales transformation. So welcome to the show, Lee. Thanks, Ez. Thanks for having us here. No worries. Um, so I'm just going to quickly introduce you, uh, Lee, to sure. the crowd. So I've got a bit, got a bit, bit of a blurb here. Yeah. Um, so we'll go through it. Sounds pretty impressive, by the way. Well, I'm old. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so for the past uh, 30 years, Lee Farnell coaches national and international management and sales teams in some of Asia Pacific's corporations. He has consistently succeeded in helping over 300 businesses, adding an estimated $200 million. That's pretty impressive, mate. Mm -hmm. As a corporate coach and professional speaker, Lee has presented at conferences throughout Southeast Asia and the US. He has also worked closely with British Standards Institute, Channel 9, the West Australian, um, Amcom, Telstra, Optus, BHP, Billiton, Australia Post, Western Power, um, Bank West, ANZ Bank, National Australia Bank and McDonald's, yeah. to name some of the few. Mm. So yeah, welcome. That's a short intro. Um, I'm going to go straight into some questions. Right. Um, so first of all, can you tell us a bit about sales transformation and, and what that's about? Well, of course, a business without sales isn't a business. And mm. what, what I've learned over the years is most people go through their whole college, university, um, could be engineering, could be finance, uh, could be any of the professions, medicine, and almost no one gets any exposure to what is the process to actually convert my knowledge or my skills into uh, revenue. You know, I mean, the great thing about what you guys do uh, and what, what I do, I mean, you guys are into branding and lead generation. And what, what I do uh, and what have I have done is work with people right across, as you can see, right across a range of industries to go, right, uh, how do we begin a conversation with a customer that's interested in us? And, of course, there's a difference between hamburgers and selling professional services. Um, but most, whether, again, whether it be a 15-year-old kid in McDonald's or whether it be a 35-year-old accountant or lawyer, um, there are conversations to have, firstly, that a customer wants to have, and secondly, that are going to optimise the, the, the customer experience and, and the revenue. But they've, we've all gone through our education and not one minute has been spent on how do I actually put the words or the science or the process into the hands of the people. Mm. And when you do that, you actually see sales go through the roof. You actually see a, a jump in sales because we call, it about, we call it everyday empowerment. You're actually empowering people to have quality conversations, mm. to have a quality customer experience and, and generate more cash flow. So it's a lot more fun for everyone. Yeah. And um, do you find that there's a bit of a change in the industry when you're talking about sales transformation? Sometimes sales has a bit of a... Um, you know, it's not it's not really a, a nice terminology. Oh, absolutely. I mean, mate, no so, one no one goes through university saying I want to be a salesperson. Correct. Yeah. You know, I mean, the fact is, uh, I say to people, I was a sales snob. Mm. Um, um, uh, my first, and again, we we say this to people. What's your when we say the word sales? What comes to mind? And in most cases, you think door to door salespeople, vacuum cleaner salespeople. Uh, car sales guys lying to you uh, and I, we've all had those experiences and, right. and you know my, my my dad was a motor mechanic and we came from a little country town in the middle of Victoria and I'll never forget uh, my old man going uh, that bloody Electrolux vacuum cleaner we paid to him that door to door guy he bloody he, he took me and yes. so that was my first mentality, uh, mentality of, it. of it. And then there was the encyclopedias, that bloody Brie, the, the, what is it, what, 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 the Encyclopedia Britannica oh, yeah, guy, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, the the you go, knocking, well, yeah. I paid a four, I'm still paying those off. <laughs> that guy got me, uh, you know, so my whole association with sales uh, was, very was bad. Negative. Yeah, so yeah. I thought, I'm going to university, I don't need to sell. And, and that's another thing that happens. The subtext in tertiary education is, just get your degree, just get your master's degree, and then the world will be a path to your door. Yeah. You know? So when you obviously go to university or you get a profession and you start your career, what you're saying is it's obviously not just your career, you've got to sell yourself. Everyone's got to be some sort of salesman to be able to bring revenue or sort of sell their output into the world. Well, into, exactly. The I mean, world. Yeah. well, let's take lawyers, for example. Mm. You know, we've done a lot of work over the years with law firms. Well, the lawyers are clearly 
some of the smartest people, they you know, get the highest marks, go to university, come out thinking they're legends. At the end of the day, um, the partners in the law firm generate the business, but at some point, the junior lawyer wants to become a partner. Well, we say your technical knowledge is only one third of the equation at that mm. point because you need to be able to have a conversation with clients, you need to actually begin to have conversations that generate billable hours and revenue. And not only that, if you want to be a partner in the firm, you also need to know how, how do I work with a team of people to collaborate and optimise the performance of the team. Mm. And so all of a sudden, the technical knowledge is one third of the whole equation. There's the business generation skills and the team management, team performance, team motivation skills. Well, neither of those things are taught in their law degree or accounting degree mm. or any other mm. of the other qualifications that are done, mm. yet they are two thirds of what's actually going to determine your success in your career. Mm. So, um, and do you find that in, in your experience, obviously working with all these uh, big companies um, and working with top level executive management, do you feel that, um, it's that it's that knowledge of sales that you obviously go in there and you do the training on top that adds another layer on top of their actual career profession what they know whether it's legal accounting finance and it allows that business to really optimize uh, look, um, yes and achieve some really good results in terms of profitability yes well yeah. let me give you an example last the last uh, two years i was working across asia 13 countries with british standards institution so they are the founders of the iso international standards organization so everything from the standard of what standard of these couches was what's the standard of these road microphones what's the standard so you know uh, all manufacturing or pharmaceuticals, everything needs to be... So these people go into organisations and have conversations with decision makers and off the back of those conversations either generate business or don't generate business. Mm. Well, invariably, um, they have not been trained in how to have a quality, what do we call a quality conversation. Uh, and so what I've done over the years, because again, because I was so bad at, and, or in fact a snob and had problems with the whole idea of sales, um, most training from the old days of uh, Zig Ziglar started as a pots and pans door-to-door -door salesman and became a great sales trainer, but it, that's old style selling. Tom Hopkins is a real estate sales trainer, uh, and so you know there's a lot of hard closing, here are 430 different ways to close a sale. Yeah. But if you're talking about business to business conversation, you're not selling pots and pans door to door, you're not selling hard hard close real estate, it's a quality professional conversation. Yep. And so what, what we've done is we've structured how to have a high quality business to business conversation and mm. invariably, um, and, and again because my brain thinks very systematically, um, we've made it very systematic but at the same time not scripted um, so that we've modularised how to transfer those skills and how to capture best practice. Because invariably, in any organisation, in your organisation as well, some people will naturally have high-quality conversations with clients and be great business generators. But invariably what happens is the great business generator isn't actually conscious of what they're doing mm. to generate business. Mm. So what we do is we help deconstruct that to go, that's what the because invariably they're blind to it until they see someone new they go you've just broken 33 rules yep. but you didn't even know you had those 33 rules or standards in your mind so we have a colour zone system that we used to deconstruct the sales process and then try capture best practice and then embed so it's sure. a bit like it's a bit like you know in the, the iPhone there's an operating system and the operating system from 10 years ago is not the same operating system as as now yeah. And so what we want to do is firstly capture the operating system and then upgrade it, upgrade it so, yeah. that, so that you have high quality business generation conversations sure. and give the client high quality uh, service and experience. So yeah. that's what we call it. Right. It's, it's, it's sales and service because it's yeah. about the winning of the business and then the serving and the retaining of the business as well. All right. So last year all the... Um uh, the tech companies on um, in terms of valuation company valuation were worth more than uh, the oil companies mm -hmm. um, this is 2019 so I guess that's a transition between how the way the world is moving so we're going from you know a, a an oil uh, driven world um, to a data driven world um, so how do you think like for everyday businesses like you know for, for companies accountants brands 
um, how do you think um, data is going to play a role in terms of sales and CRMs in, into the future? No, uh, yeah. Look, as we say, the CRM is at the heart of what we call the sales circle of life. Everything mm. from the heart of lead generation through to uh, mapping customer needs, in terms of mapping customer relationships, in terms of service standards. So it really is at the heart of the whole process. And the, the better and you use that data and train your people in using that data, then the better it's going to be in terms of conversion and customer experience. Mm. And um, I think that, like, especially for, for our agency, we, we try and focus on data, um, particularly for businesses. And it, even though um, we're doing advertising and marketing, data is really the centralization of how we can grow their business yep. and also find other audiences that are sort of mapped and profile that same data. So it goes hand in hand. So, and, and I think also that's where um, a lot of these companies like Facebook and Google, um, they're doing incredibly well is because they've managed to succeed with both. They've managed to nail the marketing and the advertising um, platform mm. and they're able to encapsulate that data of their customers, profile them. And like you said before, um, it's an opportunity to really deep dive into people, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so to learn more about them than male, female, age, um, where they're from, what company they work for, you know, sort of deep dive into those things. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, one, we talk about the 60, 30, 10, you know, 60% of our marketing should go into the clients we actually have relationships with, 30% into the same demographic. So the more we know about our existing clients in terms of who they are, what, how they make decisions, what their pain points are, what their buying patterns are, mm. the more we can then target and accurately target yep. the, 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 the other 30%. And of course, the, the old P.T. Barnum line of, you know, 50% of my advertising works, I just don't know which 50%. Mm. Now with data, you can know exactly which advertising and marketing's working. Yep. So I don't know if you, uh, did you read too much into the Cambridge Analytica scandal with Facebook? Uh, well, I remember <laughs> they used it very specifically when it came to the U.S. election. Is that, that right? Yeah, that's right. So basically, Cambridge Analytica was, is a marketing company mm -hmm. and but very specifically around um, elections and political uh, driven campaigns mm -hmm. um, that was the business and what they actually did was mine the data from within Facebook and they created um, several profiles so they created profile A B and C right and they grabbed a lot of people within an audience and they categorized them into these profiles and then they used that data to work out what pieces of content could manipulate each person, mm. so mm. to speak. Mm. Mm. Maybe manipulation's not a good word, but <laughs> yeah. it's kind of serving the right content to the right person yeah. to influence the right decision. Because a lot of people in, in political situations are fence sitters. Yeah. So that's basically what they did, but they had access to you know massive amount of data. And a lot of this data was around personality yeah. and emotion. Yeah. It wasn't so much, you know, you're a mum and you're a dad and you've got two kids. It was it was a lot deeper than that. It was, you know, what sort of personality did you have? And yeah. then once they knew what personality they have, you, you had, they could influence um, the decision in yeah. terms of what content was created to, 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 to create that transition. So I think, um, in terms of sales and CRMs, we're talking about that sort of stuff. I think for businesses, um, it is very much about, you know, first name, last name, <laughs> email address, oh. um, where they're from, phone number, e all that sort of stuff. But it's, I think the future is really about going deep diving into it and knowing what the personality traits of our customers are. Absolutely. Because then we can create content um, in landing pages, sales funnels whatever it is yep. or even people that are picking up the phone in the call center can kind of triangulate and work out how to really target that person and move them to another bracket because that's what sales is about isn't yeah. it it's about moving person from that point to another point yeah. yeah yeah well it's about how do they go about making a buying decision mm. and so the more you understand about how that customer let's say politically goes about making a buying decision and as you say on facebook what things did they like or not like, you start to get a real 
the algorithm mm. of that person's a far right or that person's very much a socialist or that person's a compassionate or that person's worried about uh, gender identity or that person. Mm. So, yeah, it's way more than what age are they and yeah. what are their income levels. Yeah, that's right. And I think um, uh, that's a very good point you're making because it's not just about information or statistics or data it's it's actually getting quite deep into the personality of someone and their emotional drivers yeah so even though it's technology driven and digital it's actually getting more information about emotion which allows us to influence that yeah the decision maker a yeah. bit better yeah, yeah. well yeah. on a business point of view mm. you might have some people who you know are happy to pay a premium because they want convenience and service mm. and there'll be other group who you know are the price buyer uh, you yes. know, you know. So once you have those profiles, yeah. your marketing and as you say, your landing pages, uh, or the way you set up your funnels, one can talk about premium product, and the other talks about price and and value or uh, price and convenience. Mm. So as you say, you can structure your strategy and your copy based on the data that you've collected. Yeah. Um, also, I mean, on that point. Um, when you talk about um, uh, profiling people and emotions and stuff and bringing emotion into sales, um, how do you, you know, what's your experience in terms of people using or salespeople using the, the, the importance of emotion to, to influence someone into moving them down the, the phases? Well, do you have some sort of strategy? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, first of all, we say pl price is elastic. If people mm. see value, and if people see value in what you're doing mm. um, and, and they fall in love with the solution, mm. then they'll find money. Mm. And, the, and then also, I mean, way back in the Zig Ziglar days, you know, uh, it's, buying is 80% emotional, 20% logic. Mm. So I want to fall in love with that vacuum cleaner. I mean, let's just say, why did my father buy that vacuum cleaner? Because when that vacuum cleaner guy tipped the dirt on the, on the carpet and then vacuumed it up to make that carpet look so beautiful in front of my mother, it's like, how does my father go, no, we're not getting that? Yeah. <laughs> now, that's not a logical decision. That's an emo And is it because he wants to make my mother happy? Mm. Or, and or is it because the, if that vacuum cleaner guy walks out of that door with that vacuum cleaner, how much grief is my father going to cop? for the next five and 10 years because he was so cheap, he wouldn't get that. Mm. And I mean, when you talk about transforming an organization, especially in sales, is that what you do? Like you kind of go into a business and say you've got a lawyer, an accountant or an engineering firm or what, what, um, whatever that might be, um, because those sort of roles and those sort of career paths are quite pragmatic in the way they work mm. um, and process driven, do you, sometimes we get lost in that, don't we? We get lost in the in the doing. Yeah. Um, and but then when it comes from a sales conversion perspective, we lose what well, what's the emotional driver here? Do you know what I mean? Like well, if, I'm, uh, if I'm going to an accountant or if I'm going to a lawyer, why is why is this customer coming to me? Why did they make the decision to use me and not to someone else? Yeah. Or they haven't made the decision to yes. use you. They're coming in to test you out. I mean, literally, uh, I'll give you an example. I was doing some work with BDO, one of the big accounting firms here in, 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 in yeah, Australia. Yeah, good example. Right? Yeah. And uh, again, it's about understanding the science of the buying process in the buyer. So this fellow who is an expert in tax uh, listens to the client's problem, gets up on the whiteboard, does all of this work on the whiteboard, shows them what could be done. The client goes, thank you, I think we can do that ourselves now. Yeah. <laughs> She goes, well, now, what, right, went, yeah. what, what, what went wrong? You know, he's gone, but uh, logically, uh, I've just given him all this great information. Well, hang on. There's a buying process here, and you need to, and I, literally I talked to a real estate guy yesterday about this. I said, you have to understand at the point of power, when you have power and when you don't have power. And there's, in all situations, there's a point where you as the expert have power, and at the moment you hand over the proposal or the information, you lose power. Mm. And of course, on this side, that's when you have negotiation and that's when you have the power to actually ask questions and move towards getting a buying decision. But the moment you give up that power, they've got the proposal, they've got the information, and now you're on the phone chasing them going, hang on, what's going on here? Mm. You've given up power. That's really interesting. So do you, do you think that um, in terms of a proposal, once you give that proposal do you try and prolong that process as much as possible do you try and streamline it 
so that you can get to the decision quicker you know kind of because you're kind of working between um getting the conversion rate up but then the um the basically increasing the com- the amount of conversions you get through the month yep so you've kind of fight you've got to fight those two battles don't yep. you yep. yep so you've got to increase your conversion rate but then you've also got to make sure it doesn't take you know the conversion lifetime value is not too long yeah so how do you how does an organization work, work well on that? well first of all particularly in business to business where a lot of people have been to university they actually think the proposal sells they think yes. it's like a university assignment yeah. and I'm going to give it to you and you're going to be so impressed that the so first of all it's, a, it's your paradigm around proposals paradigm part one is proposals don't sell human beings face to face or over the phone sell it's the mm. human interaction is where the buying decision occurs mm. the proposal should be a confirmation of what we'd agreed on not not a selling document not an enabler to sell yeah no yeah so that in itself boom that's a paradigm it switches the yeah it switches it on its that's head, right yeah. i mean we've got that policy as well when we're engaging with our clients like we don't send proposals no um of course if they're an existing client mm. and they just want an update on pricing or another project yeah. um, obviously you just send it yeah a quote but if it's a new customer we never send the proposal no. we always have the opportunity of talking through the proposal or talking to them about the approach how we do things yes and the proposal is just a supplementary thing yes to finalize the contract yes and i think even though that's a very simple thing a lot of organizations don't really now, i've had know. people send out two hundred thousand dollar proposals in an email yeah and you're thinking <laughs> i went what the hell because yeah. they're going well I, I don't they think it's a university assignment yeah. but if the person's going to read and of course what page do they turn to first they turn straight, what's the, what, what, how much, they go, turn yeah. to page 35 yeah. and say, 200, 200 grand, that's ridiculous, find someone cheaper. <laughs> and you, so, so another part of that, the, the untrained person doesn't understand is, mm. you control the process. You control the sales process. You give the client perception they're in control of the mm. process, but you control the process. Mm. Now, the reason I'm so passionate about this is because I've made every mistake in the book mm. and, and occasionally continue to do so mm. because I've not followed the science. So that's why I've captured this mm-hmm. to go, please, don't make the same mistakes I have. Mm-hmm. And, of course, when we put the tools in the hands of 5, 10, 20, 30, 100 people, man because they're all making those same mistakes yeah they are. <laughs> um so i want to sort of uh bring the the discussion around like sort of metrics yep um as you know like we're a lead gen um agency so we we bring the leads to the customer yep um where and then you're down at the other end you're getting the leads and then it's sort of like okay what does that business or that brand do with those customers yes. and how do they respond yeah um, how do they optimize those conversions, all that sort of stuff? Yeah. So some of the metrics that we uh, look at are like you know cost cost per lead from our end, and you know say if the leads come, how many leads are we sending through this month? Yep. What's what's the cost per lead? Yep. And then obviously our job is to bring that down because the more leads we can generate for a less cost, right? The more leads the customer is going to get over time. Yep. Um, and then you know we look at conversion rates on the website, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then which channels they've come through, have they come through the phone, have they come through a web form. Um, so just things like that. Yep. And then obviously there's an automation as well. Like it, sometimes those leads will get dumped straight into a CRM tool or mm-hmm. Salesforce or something like that. So can you talk to me about some of the metrics on your end that you find are critical components to keep get a get a big business moving absolutely yeah absolutely well from a sales perspective yeah absolutely yeah. well see there's two there's two sides to this as well there's the metrics around what the individual sales reps doing and then there's also the metrics of what's happening within the team the team metrics so let's just start with at the individual level I and mean, the beautiful thing about all this is the compounding effect of when you increase number of leads coming in particularly as you say at a lower cost per lead then you increase conversion rate. So if, let's say you take conversion rate from 20% to 30%. This is conversion rate when conversion someone comes rate. into us from a sales. Like yeah. you receive the lead and then the conversion of... Yeah, they actually make yeah. a sale. Making a sale out of it, yep. yeah. because, mm-hmm. I mean, as you say, you deliver. So here, here's 100 leads. Yep. Well, of those leads, if a human being's involved in the conversion process, um, then what is the conversation that human being has to convert 2 out of 10 to 3 out of 10? 
Then, what is the conversation that person has so that if the average dollar sale goes from $100 to $120, it's like, wow, now you start to get an exponential jump, Mm. which again, the untrained person in most cases won't sell on value, Mm. they'll sell on price, so they end up selling the cheapest you know, just to get the the, just the get, numbers up, or and just get someone through the door. And exactly. Get the make the boss happy. And, yeah. yeah, I've made a sale. Yeah. Yeah, but was it, did you optimize the sale? Mm. Well, what's all that about? Yeah, yeah. So when you train your people in how to one increase conversion rate by having quality conversations, when you have a quality conversation, that is, do a deep dive on the needs discovery, and then know how to present your your your, your unique offer, and then know how to actually close. Um, invariably you teach people how to increase the average dollar sale. In other words, don't just sell the cheapest, give the customer a better value solution, mm. but can also be a higher premium solution. Mm. So one, conversion rate, two, average dollar sale. And then when we start talking about uh, customer retention, what mm. we also know is that uh, something like 85% of businesses lose 15 to 20% of their customers each year that is a poor retention. So if we have a better customer retention program, Bain and Co found years ago, if you could halve that loss, you double the company's growth rate. Of course. So, okay, so in your experience, obviously you've been working with a lot of businesses, um, what would be a good retention rate in your eyes? yeah, or, well, or do you call it a loss? loss well, as you say, a, 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 a customer or? attrition. But so yeah. the, you know, on the one yeah. hand, customer attrition. Is it ten percent or like? uh, probably? Probably you know, if it got to five and ten percent, that's probably way that's a, better. Okay, so less than ten percent is great. Yeah, of customers leaving. Yeah, absolutely, because that okay. means you want to maintain contact. Well, let's just go back to the other statistic that um, a Boston consulting group found years ago. So why do customers leave? Fifteen percent leave because they find a better product. Fifteen percent leave because they find a cheaper product. Twenty um, percent uh, uh, leave because of too infrequent a contact, and forty-nine percent leave because the contact and the they did get they didn't see was of value or was of poor quality. So almost seventy percent of the reason customers stop doing business has got nothing to do with the product or the price. It's yeah. to do with the actual frequency times quality so, of so contact. All those little other little things that matter. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of conversion rate. So that's the retention rate that we talked yeah. about. But in terms of when the lead comes in and then you convert it, um, in your eyes, what's a what's a good healthy conversion rate for an organisation? Well, you know, I, I've had uh, architects mm. put out ten proposals mm. and pray that they get one yeah. in. They just go, <laughs> well, that's insane. Yeah, yeah. The amount of and no, that the amount of, and I'm sure advertising agencies and others do the same. So it's like, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, I, I think you should be aiming for somewhere between 60 and 80% conversion rate. Yeah, beautiful. I totally agree. I mean, that for us, that's our benchmark. Like, anywhere between 60 to 70% is excellent. Yeah. And I, I agree. I think if you're in a service-based business, you should be aiming for that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you. I mean, depends on the, on the industry as well. Like, if it's trades, mm. um, like, for instance, if you're a plumber or whatever, then you're getting... A lot of quotes that you're com- getting compared against so it could be down to 30 or 50 percent but then if you're on a service-based business enterprise level um, you've had that customer come through your process if your process is really sharp um, really in terms of the way you package it take them through the emotions all that you should be you should be hitting to the 60 70 percent mark yeah. sure but even if yeah. you look at the let's just take the plumber mm. if that plumber's done good branding like with, with guys like yourself and positioned themselves as better, more unique, uh, you know, there's ways of branding and all that pre-positioning. Then when they come and meet with the prospect, they take them through a proper uh, mm. needs discovery. Mm. Uh, I'll never forget years ago, we, we uh, wanted some painters to come in and paint our house. And uh, one guy came in um, at a time that was not set. I was in the area, so I thought I'd drop by paint all over his t-shirt yeah. uh, shorts that didn't fit him and when he bent over like the crack the bump <laughs> crack was shown and, 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 and literally wrote the quote out on yeah, a uh, torn uh, piece of envelope oh and it was God. like let's say it was two grand or five yeah. grand whatever the number yeah. went he'd already affronted me before he even rolled it whereas another group called Padrini Painting came went through a full on needs discovery then when I asked him some hard questions around mate how do I know you got, I'm not paying too much handled, the, handled it beautifully I don't even remember 
uh, what mm. the price was because the old story, as they say, you know, the quality remains. But it, even the, price. the way it comes, even I think the, that customer journey, like you know, getting a PDF quote, yeah, um, emailed to you with pictures attached, and and then you, you look at their email signature and they've got testimonials, yeah. all of that. So it's that you know, if, if someone's gone through the thought and the care of providing all of that information, they're obviously going to win. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's the modern um, way to approach sales as well. It's not just about getting on the phone and going, "Hey, let's you know, catch up for a coffee." Can I? Yeah. <laughs> can I sell something to you? Yeah, yeah. It, I think it's all those other attributes. Absolutely. And um, there's thing. There's a thing that I'm quite fascinated with is creating as little f- uh, as little friction as possible mm. between you, your customer, yeah. and yourself. Yeah. And that is by having case studies, um, videos, testimonials. Um, going people are able to go to your website and understand who you are and what you do just by looking at it for five seconds yeah but if all of that process is just too hard and they have to try and search and dig and find and talk to someone and did, does that make sense like yeah. you you tend to like you're actually creating more of an uphill battle um and your conversion rates are going to dive yeah absolutely so, and the untrained person doesn't use pre-positioning of the branding like, like that you've been talking about and they don't understand the power of what we call social proof that is uh, where where is there evidence to support that uh, this is a good mm. deal like mm. going back to that painting situation mm. I said to those guys well how do I know I'm not paying too much he said, well mate we win uh, 50% or more of our quotes so it shows that we're we're right in the marketplace and by the way we also do A, B, C and D which the others don't do mm. so the, he had a, a way and we actually call it the price sandwich the, 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 the drill of how do I reveal money? Mm. How do I reveal it's going to be five grand or ten grand or twenty grand or whatever the number is? Um, as distinct from that painter, well, here's the number, here's the magic number. Mm. <laughs> That's a way of revealing a number. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, what do I get? Why are you so special? Yeah. And by the way, mate, you're coming from behind the eight ball, so you better come up with something with none of that. Which yeah. Here's the magic number. <laughs> That's hardly. A, a highly professional way about doing it. That's you know? right. I think that's um, going back to social proof. I think um, there's a statistic where if you have a good social, healthy social proof around your business, it can increase your conversion by as much of by as much as 250 to 300 percent. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, these bits of information are coming into into the spotlight now. Um, some companies haven't been really active on social media now they are mm. they are seeing the impact and you've been in sales for quite a few years um talk to me about how you're seeing that side that digital side really playing into an effect um and when did that sort of when do you sort of start seeing that um in, well, in we're, we're, we're certainly seeing it in the last one to two years you know mm. i mean you've got people around the world talking about posting up to 20 times a day, but let's just give you, give you an example of um, some real estate agents I'm doing some work mm. with, um, where one of them, uh, a female down in Margaret River, has her own uh, Facebook page, and and I and, and she's already what I would call an A-grade student. On a daily basis, she's posting, which is which is one of the principles of you know don't worry about content, as in j- document what you're doing on a daily basis. Here I am with Mary Jones; she's just just listed her house with me. Here I am with Bob Smith; they've just bought number 35 Smith Street. Uh, so on a daily basis, mm. you're talking. About, and by the way, this is what we've learnt: Bob marketed his place so well um, because he put up a sign and he did this and he did that. So they're, they're, they're literally just documenting on a daily basis, which is what I do. Like even here t- today, I've just done a Facebook Live while we were setting up. Here I am at Glide Agency. It's documentation. Yeah. Documentation. Yeah. Um, so I'll just go into um, some of the things that you're, you're sort of quite active with in your industry and, in, and some of the consulting practices that you, that you um, um, sort of include in your services when you're, when you're going out to seeing clients. Okay. So, um, one of your terms is uh, million dollar sales management. Um, can you c- explain a little bit more about what that means? Yep. Well, wh- what we've learned over the years is that uh, a person becomes often a sales manager because they're a good salesperson. And what happens is uh, a good salesperson almost never makes a good sales manager because mm. the drivers that make them a good salesperson, what we know, ego and empathy, their desire to conquer, uh, when it comes to sales management, then they go into competition with their sales people. Uh, so it's two almost 
conflicting things. Conflicting yeah, yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. And so what we see time and time again, and then you go, where did that person learn to be a sales manager? In most cases, they've learned it from a, another sales manager that they had who could have also been a competing bully. So you just pick, they've just picked up the bad habit. They pick up yeah. the bad habits. Yeah. And so one of the things that drives me is stop the cruelty to innocent salespeople. You get these innocent young people in, or it doesn't matter, and you, then you just bash them up and then go, why aren't you selling more? Whereas the science of team performance, it's all there from Rick Charlesworth and the Australian hockey team to what Justin Lang is doing with the Australian cricket team. Now, there's science to how you get high performance out of people. And it's certainly... And motivational not, as well, yeah. And motivation. Yeah. Uh, and so we have taken a lot of that because my background originally I did a master's degree in social psychology in physical education so I'm uh, my interest was in high performance sports, sports. Yeah. yeah so we say a sales team and a sporting team are not that different you know there's a scoreboard um, you're putting yourself on the line on a daily basis it's a team game even though often people are doing individual things so we've incorporated a lot of that social psychology into how to get the best out of a sales team and when you do it magic happens yeah yeah that's brilliant um and you also talk about uh some things like innovation coaching yes um can you talk to me a little bit more well about that? you know it, nothing is constant except change mm. and jack wells from general electric years ago said mm. when the rate of change outside the organization is faster than the rate of change inside the organization you're going backwards so we know that the external world, as you say, technology, disruption, is going faster and faster. Mm. So you've got to facilitate change and innovation within the organisation. And so the language of innovation, and so we also say, one, coming up with the idea is not putting the idea into practice. So you need to make, so we have what we call the innovation triangle. Coming up with the idea, putting the idea into practice, and then continuous improvement of the idea. Mm. Mm. And so the whole Kaizen culture yeah, and right. creativity culture. So we've got a whole system mm. to begin the conversation around change, growth, mm. innovation to the point where we say everyone sells, everyone serves. So even if you're not customer facing, yeah. you should be selling ideas and innovation within the organisation, yeah. but you need to train the people in how to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And so you're basically creating a culture of innovation so that as technology changes within a company, um, as new things flow in, um, you're able to, I guess, make upgrades and be agile and, you know, update your systems. Um, Absolutely. Train your staff yeah. on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Now, on that note, like when companies integrate CRMs into their business, um, there's, there's a lot of um, issues we've seen mm. where a CRM can be implemented and people don't really take the up. It's not really taken well mm, within the mm, company. Mm. Um, so uptake is quite low. Mm. Um, t can you talk to us about some of the issues you've seen around that and why that happens um, within a company? And then they sometimes, you know, have to replace it. They've spent millions of mm. dollars. Like I think um, McDonald's announced the other day they spent, um, I think, close to $1 to $2 million on implementing Salesforce. Mm. And the CMO announced that it was a complete waste of money. Um, and now, obviously, they're now looking at new solutions to replace it, or whatever it might be. So, yeah, where do you see that goes wrong? In, well, it's tragic. Company? It's tragic to mm. see because literally I had a client here in, in WA mm. where we wanted to do an email out to actually ask the customers what they thought they did well or not well and to essentially to drill down and get a better understanding of the customers because, again, the only central database they had was in the finance department, customer's name, company, how mm. much they spend. But in terms of emails... Each of the individual sales managers had a spreadsheet, and email, but there was no central. So, so eventually they got involved uh, and bought Salesforce. But then the management, and, and again the Salesforce people had said, the more reports and fields you want and put in, the more likely people will, in other words, the, the harder and clunkier it will be. Mm. And needless to say, the, the actual training and the, because uh, we say involvement equals ownership equals commitment. If you want people committed to the new CRM, you've got to get, bring them with you. And even Salesforce have done plenty of research on what makes a successful implementation, uh, implementation yeah. and what doesn't. Mm. And so the, the, the data's all there, but people, it's like, again, sales managers and others think that there is a magic bullet. Mm. We'll just put it in and it'll all work. Yeah, and everything else else is going to go through the roof. Yeah. yeah. 
but I guess that's the other thing. It's like, okay, well, we've implemented this new uh, whiz bang solution, but then how do I think again going back to previous points is how do we how do we basically join the two together? How do we bring um, the data that's being stored into the marketing so that when the marketing's launched and driven, it's it's actually producing results for the business. It's not just stored away in a box and you're just adding more data after data. It's actually yeah. utilising it in, in the advertising platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's why it does need to be a change management. It mm. doesn't need to be a change management project. Correct, yeah. As distinct from we've bought, we've signed the contract with Salesforce, mm. good luck. Mm. So it needs to be seen as a journey and we need to, there's a whole range of things, everything from, you know, change leaders, the management need to be advocates of mm. it, for example, I can just tell this particular client, once it was done, the sales manager showed little or no interest in driving the project. So if mm. the sales manager was not a champion for the for the project... For the implementation, yeah, yeah. Well, if he's not using it, why should I use <laughs> yeah, it? Exactly. And if, so, yeah, exactly. So the sales manager's not using it, so then his managers didn't use it. Yeah, so it's not just the tech. The tech is one solution, but people management and getting people to buy into the solution is equally as important. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're right. look, this, this is an example we use. Mm. You know, when you fold your arms, we all have a natural way of folding our arms. And you say, okay, now change, change that. You're essentially saying to salespeople, whatever way you're doing using data now, good, now, now we're going to change it. What? Yeah, well, yeah. How do I... I've yeah, got yeah, to have yeah, a yeah. systematic approach right. to changing the pattern by which they use data. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, not the least of which, you know, um, we go, what proposals... Because what I wanted to know was, uh, which salespeople had the best conversion rate? Yeah. No idea. Well, wh which salespeople have the highest activity level? No idea. Well, how can we coach them? Because what we want to do is go, the person that has the most efficient process uh, and the highest conversion rate, let's work with them to share their best practice. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Because there's that whole thing around, all ships rise on the rising tide. Let's share that information. Hmm. Um, but you know that's that's the power of the CRM done correctly is is incredible. Yeah, um, you've also got um, a terminology which is a rear vision mirror mm. rather than a dashboard. Mm. Can you sort of explain a little bit about that? Well, yeah. we all love accountants in the finance department, mm. uh, and the finance department invariably the figures they get have already happened. In other words, they're the result. In the world of NLP, we say use the right process, get the right result. In other words, we want to have what we call predictive KPIs, not just result KPIs, which are rear vision mirror. Well, that's mm. that's last month's figures. Mm. But what are we? What what is happening real time, where we can be uh, making decisions on the and fly? On the fly, mm. not the least of which is things like activity levels, uh, number of proposals you've put out this mm. week, or number of calls you've made. Well, I mean, that's kind of like what we're doing with the digital advertising is that we've got live dashboards so people can see down to that that particular day or that week if leads are down revenues down or whatever it is it's kind of all encapsulated on that dashboard yes so i'm presuming that's what you're saying is that from when the sales are coming in well how many proposals have we done this week how many what's our conversions of those proposals you know if they're a little bit low then we need to ramp things back up we need yeah. to get out there more speak to people network whatever it is exactly they're so. predictive kpis mm. like if you take afl football mm. uh if you just measure how many goals we kicked that's all very well mm. but how many center bounces did we win how many mm. times have we been inside 50 mm. well, what's our tackle count yeah I mean, that's right you know david parkin at one stage said um we know if we have 15 sacrificial events before half time will win the game <laughs> yeah what the hell's a that's sacrificial right. event yeah and yeah. well, especially, I mean, when, when it's half time, you need to have those metrics in place yeah. so that you can make the decision so you can adjust your team, adjust yeah. the strategy. So it's very similar to business. Absolutely. That's so what I think now more than ever, we need more real time data in our reporting. Um, so that's what that terminology is around. That's yeah. exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. And mm -hmm. so you just convert sport, uh, not the least of which, like I would say, one of the things we do is go, um, uh, how detailed was your blue zone discussion? Mm. Uh, invariably, you know, if a person asks two questions in the needs discovery, that's different than if they ask five questions or seven or ten. Um, so sometimes we'll go, show me your notes. Mm, mm, mm. Show me the notes. How much detail did you collect in that mm, needs mm, discovery mm. discussion? Yeah, yeah. That's going to be a good predictor of, uh, even to the point where, you know, I mean, in India, they were, well, you, you, like in, in football, they are now were telemetry devices in terms of how much territory do they cover, where were they, uh, how 
how many tackles did they do? You can't quite do that in sales, mm. but there are ways to go, uh, what, how many quality conversations have you had today mm. or this week? Mm -hmm. That in itself is going to make a massive difference. Yeah. Well, I think that's um, pretty much um, our conversation for today. Right, how long do we have? <laughs> Gee, oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> it does go fast. Yeah. Um, so Lee, um, how, could you tell us, um, tell our viewers how, how they can find out more about you and what you do? Sure. Um, and where do they go? Well, first of all, you can go to my website, uh, leefarnell.com. Uh, go to my uh, Lee Farnell Best Business uh, on, on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, as I said, one of the things I've done over the last year or so, I've put together this white paper on the secrets of sales transformation. In other words, what are the factors that lead to companies having successful sales transformation programs uh, versus where they fail? Mm. So, you know, my mission is to help companies optimise their potential uh, in terms of sales. So if people want to get a hold of that, touch base with us. Uh, we also have an online diagnostic, which again, via our website, they can get hold of, do a deep dive on their own uh, to go, where are, the, where are the areas for opportunity to take my sales and business to the next level? Yeah, that's brilliant, Lee. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Ish. Thanks, Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. That's a wrap. Thanks. <laughs> Beautiful, mate. <laughs>